Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Firefish Crowdcast. Delighted to be joined by David Higgins. Um, if anybody doesn't know David, he's a bit of a legend in the tech recruitment market. Um, so he was uh, at CEO of Harvey Nash a wee while ago and um, then has tried to retire, he told me, but that didn't go very well. Um, and he didn't know what to do with his time. So he very quickly got uh, taken up with lots of different companies that he has been um, advising on the board. So he's in prime position right now to tell us what are leaders of our industry sector being able to actually discuss at boardrooms the problems and challenges that you will all be facing. And he's very willing to share lots of thoughts here today. So I'm looking forward to this session. I think um, David, you said you're, you're currently with Levy Europe, RP International, Vantage Consulting, Montrossel, Mixtol, and the one I can't pronounce, da, da, Daminos, is that? Is that yeah, Danos. Danos, there you Danos, go as well. Yeah. So, you know, large good agencies um, and, and, and ones that will be addressing lots of the points that we're going to, to, to look at, which the title today is we're going to face up to the fact that, hey, we've come through sort of five months of that crisis period with COVID. And now we're really looking at, you know, what is the future like and how has recruitment changed? So I suppose if we can sort of say hello to you first and thank you for right. coming on board. Welcome, everyone. I hope, yeah. I hope you find the session useful. Oh, I'm sure we will. And then let's just take that sort of first topic in terms of like in your view right now in the boardrooms you're sitting on, what are the boards talking about of how COVID has changed? What is the new normal going forward? I mean, the real, the real change is remote working. Um, there's going to be a higher percentage of staff that will want to remain remote working. Um, and I'm seeing that through already. And how do, how do firms manage and balance balance that. And I think getting that right is, a, is going to be a challenge. Um, I think different styles of management have had to evolve. Again, traditional recruitment style of management in line of sight. Um, again, trying to keep remote working, working from home engaged requires a different, different style of management. Um, I think also uh, not just recruitment companies, but companies as a whole uh, will look to have a more flexible uh, workforce model and therefore the growth going forward will be uh, more around temporary and gig economies rather than permanent. And then of course um, key changes, what do we do with our office space? If only 25% of our workforce wants to come back, we've got room for the other 75%, how do we use that? And I'm seeing a lot of recruiters um, and business owners going, do we use it as a hub? Do we actually just not renew our lease? Do we go more localised? Do we have a meeting, a meetup? zone or a client a client interface uh venue uh, so those challenges are going to need to be addressed so let's unpick some of these because there's some really good subtopics there um and one of the biggest ones you know i think the stats that you've said very similar stats to i've um, i've been seeing as well about 20 percent of most workforces are still saying that they're they're really keen on coming into the office, the rest of it, 80% are very happy actually with continuing a remote working. So that is flipping it completely on its head. What does that mean for the recruitment leaders, the managers, you know, from going to, hey, I can see my guys, they're all coming in, to how do I actually coach, manage a de you know, decentralized workforce? It's a real challenge, actually. I think what, what's happened is successful uh, consultants uh, with experience that have now recognized that I can, be, I can be very effective and not do the one and a half, two hour commute a day. They're the ones that will be able to say, I'll come in twice a week. But the impact of that is um, how do they transfer their knowledge and skills to the more junior staff? So it's a learning and the L&D side that I think will be a real challenge. The knowledge transfer that people pick up listening to people um, and one-to-ones that if you're there in a pod next to, you know, there, there's one business that said, said to me, as soon as I find someone who's particularly good, I sit as many juniors around him or her, and actually the knowledge cascades. And I think that's a real, real challenge, actually. Um, and, and have you started to, you know, actually dig into that and say, right, how are we going to solve that? You know, effectively, if you can't physically sit with that sort of great recruiter, you know, the recruitment industry has been very much let's take graduates in and train them up you know there are a lot of recruiters out there will probably would not say hey i'm going to be a recruiter one day and have fallen into the industry and it's one that we love but we have been very lucky to be sitting beside great top billers and learn from them have you started to think about strategies as to how you can take a graduate now and actually train them up um that's a very good question um and a lot of 
people that I've spoken to and owners I've spoken to who have questioned whether that's now a strategy they want to pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly a number of businesses have gone, actually, I'm only going to hire more experienced consultants. There are more consultants on the market with greater experience. And at this stage, I don't want to take uh, an, an inexperienced individual who's going to farm uh, key accounts that may or may not be buying or continue to buy. So therefore, that's a risk. So I'm seeing people making the leap of actually we're going to at this stage focus on experienced hires to address that. <laughs> And that probably doesn't surprise me. And actually, I think we're we're seeing that in terms of, you know, the 18 to 25, you know, age gap of people coming and hitting the marketplace yeah. is going to be very tough for them. And there has to be some form of incentives or companies seeing that as an opportunity to help that. I mean, one of the, one of the impacts of working from home is actually the technology has now proven that it works. I mean, if you think back 10 years, if you asked your boss, can I work from home for one day a week because my commute's too long, they were going, no, I've got to have you yeah. in the office. But actually, the technology works this time, and people have been a lot of people have seen better productivity than they did in the office, and that that poses a real opportunity for recruiters because someone based in the Midlands or someone based in London can actually facilitate someone working from from Colchester, Norfolk, you name it, doesn't matter anywhere, not even just in the UK, they could still be a productive member of the team. So actually, there's some real opportunity to get key hires working remotely and build your business that way. So, David, with that, because that's been something I've been looking at as well and sort of work from anywhere is the concept you're almost describing there. Um, how do you think that's going to affect the London waiting on salaries and the cost of living in, in, in sort of key London areas? Well, if you follow Goldman Sachs's rule, you can work from home, but we're going to reduce your pay in London waiting allowance and travel allowance. And that's actually what other businesses are following. Suit. To do. I think the other, the other, the other critical point actually which is more of a social you know mental health is, is a key issue um, and actually staff engagement when through this period is, 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 a, is a critical and sensitive topic but the loss of social contact and the impact on company culture is a real challenge and this is all new mm -hmm. for, for us um, and people are very aware of that and there's no real solution at the moment but people are driving hard to ensure that they instill that company contact and that what that company so that company culture uh, and the social contact element albeit social distancing and it's all the all the bits that you've got to then try and do and you mentioned that with some of the businesses that you're dealing with are looking at the space that they've got because a lot of the companies will be tied into you know five years lease still yeah. um and those that are looking at the concept of a hub so yeah. You know, have have they started to think about that office as a place of purpose to come and be creative and share ideas? How how have they taken that idea? Have anybody started to look at what that or or, or get a picture of what that looks like? Um, I th it's a bit false at the moment. If you've only got twenty percent of your staff back, um, and it depends on on the on the type of company and culture. So there's no one size fits all. I mean, there's one firm that's definitively said, "I've got most of my." uh consultants and managements based in south london why do i need a central london office which is very expensive i might as well either have or not have it and have a local office there so that's certainly someone there there's another firm very forward thinking who didn't renew their lease uh in december last year and they basically completely got done away with the office and and use social media and um all the various technology tools to manage their people remotely and have continued to be successful very small business I mean, I, I bet you they are sort of going great. That's paid off to make that decision in December. That's that's a great decision to make. So I'm going to put that over to yourself, David, because you have shared that um, technology, although is the sector you recruit in, but actually using technology yourself um, is is not maybe your your greatest um, skill set from that perspective. So how do you feel as somebody that's been thrown into this? Um, and now have to learn so many different tool sets. You know, how, how are you feeling about that yourself? It's, you know, it's it's a necessary part <laughs> of the job now, actually. Um, you know, who would, who knew how to use Zoom, Skype, uh, Teams before they existed? No one. And actually, yeah. um, it feels very odd doing it the first few times, but it's now the new norm. And I must have done 150 of each yeah. over the last five months. So from that perspective, I'm very comfortable with it. Yeah, well done. You've made the transfer over. <laughs> you do feel a bit like a performing monkey, but apart from that, <laughs> you do these dooms in one day. It's bad for the health. 
It, yeah, it definitely, I, I think I said to you, it definitely means at the end of my week, I feel like I've deserved my gin and tonic, but um, yeah, definitely. So, so in terms of the growth strategies, we've also both been talking about the fact that, you know, how is this different to other recessions? And we both lived through obviously the, the financial um, recession back in 2008, 2009, and the challenges of coming that coming out of that and looking at growth strategies from a recruitment point of view, because that's really where people are coming back, they're making decisions right now, and they've got to plan ahead. You know, what what do those plans look like? How does a recruitment leader that's sitting on Listen just now actually go ahead and, and realistically plan for the future? I think that's a real challenge. Um, I think there's still an element of uncertainty. We've, we've witnessed COVID, that's had an impact on the economy, but no one quite knows what the impact on the economy is gonna look like over the next three to six months. So planning really has to be line of sight of revenues. So, you know, anyone that's doing a three to six year plan, I reckon after six months, sorry, a three to six month plan, I reckon after three months, you know, that's guesswork rather than reality, unless you've got a contract book that's stable. So it's it's really living a bit like the here and now. Um, I think also with the remote working, those firms that can get the blend of office management of office and remote working right they're the ones who are going to who are going to be successful mm -hmm. um, i think those companies also that have either been lucky enough or smart enough to focus on the right sectors that have been less affected uh, by covid um, and also those ones who have pivoted out of sectors that have been affected by covid they're the ones that um, that will do well um, going forward and Ben's just actually raised a nice question there that's very connected to this um, and I'm sure is 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 very much on it, it's very easy for I think employees right now to decide yeah great we're going to do a blended approach I, I, you know not talking out of turn but I'm sure that a lot of employees are thinking this is fab I'm at home I've got the flexibility but they don't maybe have thought about what do I need from an employer if I'm working from home and on the exactly same time the leaders i'm sure ben ben's just asked this as well is thinking okay this is great i'll go with that i know that that will mm. be the right way forward but how do i motivate teams when they're decentralized really challenging and everyone's doing it a little bit differently um and i think uh when you look at um, those people that are performing then you you need to let them carry on but try and engage them either at least once a day you know, it's a lot of it's the same line of sight management techniques, but it's actually doing one to ones, weekly wrap ups or creating team accountability. So a lot of it's the same technique, but it's online. And actually, that's quite tiring for management to do. You can't really feel whether you're getting across to someone. So that that needs to be reinforced. Um, so I just think it's it's more of the same, but you've got to keep doing it. Um, and actually, a lot of people are saying, well, come into come into the office for training. Um, come into the office for for your one to one. So trying to get them uh, to balance their time, getting comfortable back in the office. But to be honest, you know, if people don't want to travel into London, you can't force them to. If they want to get on a tube or a bus, probably not. So that's that's the development of online learning, which is helping. There's lots of growth in online learning uh, modules, which people are probably seeing now through various third parties, all designed to try and keep the, the firm motivated. Have, have you or um, any of our audience there as well, feel free to use the comments at the side, you know, seen any companies doing something that's really quite creative and has worked? Because I think that's what people are looking at because they cannot, you know, th although it's harder for a manager to take what they did on the office and transfer online, that's the sort of easy transfer. But I think it has to change a little bit now because we're using, you know, for example, you know, our fish, we have fish Friday every Friday where instead yeah. of going to the pub, you know, we're all online having some, yeah. some gins and tonics together. Now that that's cool. And, and Scotland has been slower out of lockdown than the rest of the UK. So everybody was still motivated because they couldn't go out anywhere. Yeah. But as the pubs open up and everything else, you know, I'm not <laughs> sure we're going to get the same engagement as uh, we have had in our, our fish Fridays. So, right. you know, it's it's recognizing that we can't just take what we had that's and right. transfer it across. Anybody, any, you got any good ideas of, of, of what you've seen some of the companies do, some creative things. Virtual virtual pubs on a Thursday, quiz nights. You let uh, them drink on a Thursday? Virtual <laughs> <laughs> drinking. Um, uh, I mean, I think some of the games that people used to play, they do it online. But you're right, you've got to you've got to mix it up. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, no one's doing this. Everyone's doing something different. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um, I think the virtual pub nights on Thursday is good. Funny enough, people are now going, let's go to a park uh, and then have a, have a picnic, social distancing, and just start try to bond. Uh, some people went off and played golf, um, which you're allowed to do. So those are two, two virtual, well, they're not virtual, they're real uh, motivation and team, team building side. And it's difficult to build teams, um, mm -hmm. isn't it, when, when, you're, when you're online? We, we've started onboarding um, you know, new employees and we haven't met them. And one of them's just passed their probationary period. So he's been with us for three months and Brilliant. we haven't met him. And yeah. that's you know, something as well that all recruitment companies will be starting to do as well. Um, yeah. you know, so it's, it's really interesting as to how not only do you know everybody that you're working with to be able to interact, but actually how do you get to know new members of staff that would come in as well? Uh, agreed, I think. Some, I mean, COVID's changed recruitment processes um, and clients' talent, talent plans and talent processes. So recruiters have got to ask different questions to make sure they really understand the different pain points um, so that they can tailor their service accordingly. Mm -hmm. And thanks. I see that, Kirsty. Thanks for posting that in. So, um, you know, I think we've all done sort of weekly quizzes, but I quite like what you've suggested is that each person was responsible for each of their rounds. I think if I had to add like a quiz that I had to organize to my weekly tasks, well, I think I would, that would possibly kill me, but I really like that. So it's everybody then, night. yeah, then everybody's yeah. doing their own bit. Night. Yeah, it's quiz yeah. night, silly hat night, you name it. <laughs> no, no, br brilliant. Cool, okay, so what, what I also want to look at now is when we're growing on those companies, you know, do we think that the market is leveled out in terms of larger recruitment agencies and smaller agencies? What generally happens, and I'm sure you're, you would agree in, 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 in times like this, and we've seen a lot of you know, recruiters unfortunately getting made redundant, but they're all still skillful and they can start up very easily from you know, uh, getting back into to things and, and set their own business. So at this point in time, there is a large amount of people that are going to be going in as independents and then some of them will grow as well. So does a smaller agency have more of an advantage or how could they become more, have more of an advantage over some of the larger companies? I think you've got a small, if you've got a smaller workforce, you're more agile. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that, I mean, you can dry, drive and try new initiatives quickly across the business. Uh, bigger businesses obviously struggle, it's huge change management projects, um, but actually smaller businesses are more nimble. So if market circumstances change, um, you know, it's quite, they're very good at normally adapting. I think also smaller business management and owners tend to be better connected to their markets and therefore they can read the tea leaves and instigate change quickly. So you've just got, you know, you've got a, you've got a racing car that actually you've got someone at the helm who can, who can or go-kart, who can really get get the business uh, in the right direction or pivot. Bigger businesses, hundreds of people, do you know what? Half of them aren't coming in, the other half don't want to come in, the 25 that do come in, you know, how do, how do you really manage that huge program of getting back to normal? And I know, you know, the larger recruiters are struggling. You know, how do you create that team, that momentum? Um, how do you, you know, if you're used to working with a team of 40, 50 people, you know, and only a third of them in at one stage, another third in half the day, you know, I think they face huge disruption um, and therefore they're, they're, they're going to be more effective. Um, and actually, if you look at what I've, what I've learned uh, and seen performance wise, it's been the smaller specialist uh, niche players that have done well in lockdown, closer to their market, been able to change and adapt and adopt quicker. And therefore, they, they've been able to, to deal with their clients' needs and stay close to their candidates and be and less disruptive. Absolutely. I think that's one of the things that everybody that's listening to this, you have to be proud of the agency that you're in. If it's small, sometimes you can think, oh, I'm only one or two, three people, but that is your advantage right now. Yeah. And it's being aware of that and running with it. And um, if you can get ahead of the game right now, then, you know, it, it's, um, it's going to stand you in, in, in great stead for when the comeback comes. Um, yeah. I know that you don't have a crystal crystal ball right now, but if I was to sort of push you, you know, mm. I'd really be interested in, in your oversight as to how you think the next six months are going to run for the industry. Um, gosh, that's a bit like being an economist trying to uh, predict the, uh, the economy. Um, I think it's difficult to feel anything that, um, 
the market will be challenging and remain so. If there's a second spike, then that really will affect demand. Um, so, you know, I think you've got to keep your costs under control. Um, you've got to be, stay close to your clients um, and you've got to make sure that your cost base and revenues are aligned. Um, so for me, I think autumn will be a challenge um, with an expectation that if you're fit uh, and lean, then 2021, you should be, should be able to, I think, to recover and, uh, and start trading actively again. Now, part of the consultancies that you have joined as well, I know that I noticed in the past that, you know, you've looked at people, um, you've looked at the processes and, you know, the position side of it, sort of three P's that you've sort of lined up as well. Um, and I think, you know, very much in a recruitment agency business, we think about one person and you add on a head um, and that gives you, a, you know, a, an individual P&L of each of those people that then give you the sum of what you're planning, okay, in terms of your turnover and revenue and GP. Yeah. Um, but I think really now is the time to look at well, when you use that word leaner and fitter to go forward, that's just not about people, is it? That's about. It's about back office. It's about spend. Uh, but it is about people. You know, a lot of a lot of people's growth models was we're going to hire lots of graduates, build an academy, which is very expensive, and recognize that a smaller percentage of those people will then make it through to stay in the three years when they start being productive. You know, that's a challenging model to do when you're uncertain about your clients, their buying patterns and the level of demands and the economic. You know, the American economy, economy, you know, if they catch a chill, so does everyone else. Um, it's going well at the moment, but that's mainly due to the election coming up and US presidents like to fan the economy up so they get reelected. But if that take, catches a kill, a cold, sorry, or a chill, um, then that'll have, have an effect on Europe. And the European economies are also they're all looking reasonably healthy, but it's relatively fragile. And earlier you were saying as well um, that one of the businesses that you actually have been sort of involved in has been in one of those sectors because you said, listen, some of the sectors are definitely winning and some of the sectors are challenged a little bit more. And one of the ones that you're involved in is, uh, you know, an agency in aviation. Do you want to tell me a little bit in terms of, you know, how that sector's because from a perception, we're thinking, gosh, that's going to be really challenging. How, how have they, you know, how has that sort of started to adapt and the challenges they've had? Um, well, in aviation, clearly every, everyone's grounded and mm -hmm. it's in the newspapers that they're cutting costs. Um, so what, what that means is no investment in people, reduction in IT spend. However, um, luckily for them, it was the business critical projects that are going to make a difference to those aviation clients in the next five, 10 years in terms of efficiencies, cost saving and profits that have, that have kept them still uh, with consultants on site. So there's always winners and losers, same in retail. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to, to have private aviation, then they boomed in the last uh, six months. Um, but, you know, a lot of those companies have got deep pockets. British Airways has just raised 1.9 billion. They're still, you know, one of my clients is still doing very well there in terms of business critical projects. How, how do you feel about the bank lending scenario um, in terms of, you know, how, how supportive do you think that the banks are going to be with that sort of, you know, let's go and borrow and sort of trade our way out of it? I think the government's done a pretty good job actually mm -hmm. uh, in making sure the banks have shored up their balance sheets and I'm hearing relatively positive stories across the industry. Um, there are obviously people where their, their bank managers said, no, we're not gonna lend you any more money or no, you can't extend your facility. But most, mostly I'm hearing positive news that the lending at the, this stage is, um, is relatively positive. However, you know, if the economy takes an enormous downturn and their, their borrowing books look, look less healthy, then that'll have a knock-on effect to the rest mm -hmm. of the recruitment industry and and their and other industries. But at the moment, I I think borrowing is looking is looking positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about sort of you know smaller agencies in terms of um, ones that are either? I mean, we've 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 chatted about this in the, in sort of previous episodes as well, but you know, ones that have to look at pivoting or the different style of recruitment. Have you got any sort of over you know? 
when recruitment comes back, you know, we've all been led by the contingency model. Do you think that that will just pick up exactly the same? Or are you encouraging different models, different sectors that, you know, people are sort of actually going in and tackling now? I mean, there's always going to be a need for, for contingency recruitment. Uh, people are looking at ways in which um, they can add real value, statements of work, building offshore teams uh, to save clients' costs. Um, so, you know, there are there are various uh, other models. Uh, certainly training uh, in specific niches like um, Java or development skills, and development skills, sorry, you know, people like FDM have done very well. Um, so there are, there's evolutions. I think technology is going to shorten and speed up processes. So recruiters are going to have to get smarter as to work out where they can add value. Mm -hmm. And if, if, it, if they disrupt and commoditize um, certain markets, then you'll need to step up and, and, uh, and add value in what you bring. Excellent. And so looking now going forward because that's been really interesting to get your insight as to what you know those types of companies are doing right now if you had some advice to really sort of look at the recruiters that are wanting to skip ahead just now and make sure that they are ready for um you know the upturn you know yeah. what what would you say that you know they should be focusing on right now i think they've got to use every single technical tool that they can so that their service to clients and candidates is fast and effective. Um, whatever artificial intelligence, intelligence and robotics to help them source quicker, build candidate communities better, create longer and more sticky relationships with candidates, uh, that'll stand them in good stead. I think where consultants and business need to add value is subject matter expertise. And some of them skip it or it's relatively thin. But if you're going to engage with candidates that have been contacted robotically, and clients to create meaningful, long-lasting, sustainable relationships. Subject matter expertise is going to is going to be what counts. In fact, all the businesses that have done particularly well have demonstrated that. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, clients, as I think I alluded earlier, clients have got a different set of challenges hiring post-COVID. Recruiters and group companies need to understand those and adapt and adopt what services and how they help those clients. Uh, to provide a, a meaningful uh, talent solution. And, you know, one thing like, like we're doing today, one thing online and, and social media strategy is critical. You know, you've got to stand out from the crowd, not just the business and your website, but actually individual consultants have got to build their own, uh, their own profiles within the relevant sectors and, and candidate communities that they service. So that last point is really interesting because I've been a big advocate of that as well. I'm very comfortable with the fact that, you know, people will come to Firefish and we we make them stars. <laughs> you know, we we make we help them and encourage them to make noise. But it's one thing that I've also when I've been talking in the circuits with recruiters, um, it's something that every recruitment leader is um, is concerned about because what happens when they leave? You know, what, what if you're encouraging customers to actually your recruitment companies to sort of build up and allow those recruiters to get online and have their own, um, you know, presence online, you know, where would how how are you sort of getting over that sort of recruitment leader sort of barrier of what happens if they're no longer with me? I'm not sure I quite follow the, the, the question. There. So I, I from what you'd said there, um, you had. You had effectively said that we've got to get online, we've got to allow yeah. our recruiters to get online and we've got to have a good presence. And that comes down to the individual online, you know, supporting the brand. But um, and I'm I'm very much on the same page as you yeah. there. However, one of the kickbacks when I've been talk talking and mentoring other recruiters is that recruitment leaders are concerned about doing that because they right. may leave. It's a perennial challenge. You know, if they're not doing it online, then they've got the CVs. Uh, you know, in their drawer or on a spreadsheet, you know, on an Excel spreadsheet. So, you know, it's nothing new going online. However, if everyone else is online and candidates are more online and more social media sa savvy than they were 12 months ago, 24 months ago, the last three to four months, everyone's doing it. If you just think about the success of online companies, everyone's been online. So we've got to get fit, we've got to get up to date, and it's a real opportunity. Um, and the, the challenge there is how do you protect your business? Well, that's all about management, incentives, culture, 
uh, and opportunities. If yeah. we, hopefully, if, if we all strive to run our businesses properly and provide real careers uh, and opportunities for our staff, they'll stay. Yeah, and, and I think that's the way, isn't it? It's like you don't have a choice now because everybody else is going to start doing it. So you've that's got to right. get you've got to get on 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 the game and do it. We've had another question in because this um just from our audience as well from Kathy. Now, um, so how does subject matter expertise fit with the potential pivot? Which is quite a wide question there, but um, I guess where mm -hmm. Kathy's coming from is that you know if you are if you're from aviation, how does your subject, you know, wh which 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 industry do you think you should pivot yeah. to? I think, Kathy. If not, please pop in some more notes on the side or the question to um, further explain that. Well, it's the skills that you're hiring in aviation. You know, is is you, you try and look to it for adjacent markets. You know, is it aerospace, defence? Mm -hmm. you know, those similar type of, of people and skills are, are relatively transferable. But you know, aviation is one, aerospace, defence is another. So that's what I'm talking about, about pivoting. I think, you know, if you're if you're doing IT and then want to go into accountancy recruitment, that might be a bridge too far. Yeah. But actually, you just, you know, it's very interesting. A lot of uh, the training businesses that I that I uh, support are saying we don't read enough. And actually, if you're going to a new market, you should actually have a reading list specifically to learn about that market. And that allows you then actually if you want to develop a new market to put in place the properly reading list that the consultants and leaders all, all adhere to. Do you know, it's a great point to be finishing on because that's that's a wee nugget, um, a golden nugget there, because essentially you've talked about learning and development and in many ways you're saying actually the learning and development within recruitment companies may be cut with recruitment academies, et cetera. But what you're almost saying there is the industry matter yeah. and, and the learning sort of ethos of, you know what's happening in your industry that actually needs to get better yeah yeah well you're never too old to learn um and actually if you look about the online learning uh take up has been enormous and you know from, from management to consultants to graduates uh and to business leaders and to non-execs you know there's mm -hmm. always something you can learn every day um it was, it was a great saying that um you can only be as good as you think you are but you've got to know more than that. So, well, that I, I love that phrase, and my phrase is every day is a school day. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> there's not every day that I'm learning something from my team or something else from somebody else, and you know I'm I'm lucky that I'll be taking some some stuff away from you, David, as well today. And um, just before we finish up, I've just got Kathy that's actually explained a little bit more about what she's saying. She's she's specialising in tax recruitment right now and has years experience with a business, you know, but audit is really busy. But she's worried because, and this is a very great question um, explained like this, because she's worried if she pivots over, she's going to lose her USP because she's relied on that USP yeah. and the tax for so long. Should she stick with it, see it out or make the jump? There you go. Gosh. That's a question to end on. Gosh, um, could be career defining. Um, <laughs> I would I would I would stick to tax because let's face it the government's borrowed so much money that all it can do is tax us all uh, and everything else as much as possible so i guess tax is going to be busy for the next 5 10 15 years as they try and pay for for the support they've given business uh, in the last 6 months so i would have thought that market's going to remain strong Kathy, I hope that is your money question. Thank you, David. I would agree with that too. I think that's really, really good piece of advice. Listen, thank you so much for everything you've Pleasure. shared. Um, that has been so interesting. And I know that everybody from the, the, the questions we've had and the comments, they've all enjoyed that as well. So I really, really thank you for contributing. Um, Amy has just uh, put up in the comments your LinkedIn profile. And um, if anybody wants to um, go in and uh, contact uh, with David, um, I'm sure you're, you're good with LinkedIn uh, connections. Yep. Is that all right? good yep, excellent absolutely. um op open open for connections um and uh, hopefully you'll be able to help but thank you to everybody as well um, for coming in. Um, we're actually going to be talking a little bit more um, about actual well-being um, and your mental, mental health and areas that will stop you from burning out and areas um, in our next crowdcast in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to that because it is going to grow into such a bigger area yeah. that we've been all aware on recruitment, but we haven't perhaps tackled. So I really want to tackle that area and give some insights on all of that. So please tune in. Um, and no doubt you'll get a, an auto um, a, an auto invite for the next uh, episode. And if you like what we're doing, 
please support us by liking us on all the various different podcasts and, and crowdcasts and everything we're at um, on Spotify. Just put your thumbs up because that keeps us doing this. Um, it's hard work pulling all together, but um, if you guys are getting some out of it, then that's, that's part of our values to give back. So thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks as well. David, thank you Pleasure. so much for everything.